Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Writers. This week, I am going to be your host. I am Peter Barracchini, and I'm joined by co- my co host and fellow prospects expert, Matthew Zader and Devin Little. Usually, you know, Matt is hosting the show, but today, because his rankings came out, his top 96 April ones for the 2022 NHL draft was released earlier this week, we're going to be diving into that and you know ripping it apart just like they ripped apart mine last week joking it's all in fun of games um <laughs> but before we get into the episode this week's show is always brought to you by morningskate.io the daily newsletter delivered to your inbox monday to friday jam packed with the best hockey stuff on the planet your daily dose of nhl news rumors histories funnies etc cetera, etc cetera. all the hockey fun and information into your email by the hockey writers from our great writing staff you'll see a link in the show description below type in your email and it will come straight to your inbox as we mentioned at the top of the show this week we're diving into matthew's latest top 96 april rankings for the 2022 nhl drafts and to kick things off we are going to look at the top five and review that i i'm pretty sure we know who number one is but matt take away take it away with your top five yeah, well, I didn't uh, go crazy and start a big war, you know, changing my number <laughs> one, as uh, some people have already and put Cooley at first. But I mean, most of the time, most places are Shane Wright. So, yeah, number one, Shane Wright uh, coming in second, uh, Logan Cooley. I'm still there. Uri Slavkovsky's go in number three now. Simon Nemitz uh, in four and Matthew Savoy uh, rounding out that uh, that five. And there we have it, uh, the top five there. Devin, do you agree or disagree with what Matt has with his top five? Yeah, I mean, that's the same group of five that you have, Peter, right? Um, And going back to last week's episode, uh, I like that group of five as the top five. Um, I I think that this is more or less, I I, I think Matt's is more or less in line with how I did it. You know, I I said last week that you maybe shift one or two guys around in the top Mm. five. Um, I, I think this is more or less where I would have it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's hard to disagree with that. Cause I think everyone's having that consensus top five right there. Maybe even when we talked with Tony Ferrari a few weeks ago, maybe Brad Lambert can be slotted into that top five based on his, you know, overall ceiling and projection. And you know what? I know I had Simon Nemich at three because of the fact that right-handed D steady, poise on the back end uh six points in seven playoff games knocked off philip mezar and uh propod in the playoffs so great to see some 2020 competition head to head right there um but yeah i mean having your Slavkowski in there isn't you know end all be all i think i think he deserves to be in that top three conversation no matter what given what he's done the consistency the size the strength the physicality it just screams nhl top six forward right then and there but then again nemich top pairing defenseman as well so you can't go wrong with either or heading into the rest of the top 10 matt who do you have this is where changes happen uh yeah. there's quite a few different guys that weren't in my top 10 um before or moved up uh so six is brad lambert we just talked about him a little bit there brad lambert in six and now he's above yoel kim kamel who dropped from my top five into the bottom um jonathan lakaramaki a big riser and goes to the eight uh frank nazar in nine and then another big riser of mine going to the top 10 is denton matechuk of the moose Jaw warriors uh we'll talk a bit about him later on but yeah he rounds out my top 10 yeah, a lot of movement in that top 10. I'd say more movement compared to mine. Um, Devin, or I, I, I'm going to actually, I'm going to start off with, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm still reeling from, you know, the Jay's win. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, again, it's that episode. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that that's a very solid, you know, 
rounding out the bottom five of the top 10. Um, you know, obviously Lambert with his skill, uh, Kemel, uh, there was some issues with his consistency post injury. Obviously he's able to put that behind him and he's starting to get hot at the right time. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of LeCarrie Mackey and the shot and the poise and confidence and the patience that he has to with his offensive awareness and vision, just absolutely screaming top 10 potential at this point. And the Tate Chuck, I mean, obviously really great speed awareness, um, bit of on, on the risky side for me, but Hey, you know, if teams like that, they like that. Um, Devin, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I really like your last point there about uh, Matej Chuck. Um, he's the one that really jumps out to me in, in terms of uh, this top 10. Because um, I, I certainly think he's a top 20, maybe even a top 15. Top 10 is really interesting for me. Um, and I know that's starting to gain some steam out in the community. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not completely out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but but, I, but I'm with you, Peter. I, I, he's, he's one of those players that I think carries some risk. I think 10s. A little rich for me, but I, I see where I see where you're coming from, Matt, with that ranking. He's he's dynamic as hell. So yeah. if if he's he's a player that if he hits, he's gonna be something really special in this league. So um, you know, we could we could go on and on about the other ones, but the one that really stood out to me was Matei Chuck. So I wonder too if you know, Matt, uh, feel free to chime in, but they said the same thing about Luke Hughes last year with his offensive yeah. potential and his yeah. awareness and game. And, you know, the defensive side wasn't quite there. Do you agree that with that sentiment or, or is I, or am I just, you know, looking too much into things right now? No, I, I, that's true. I think uh, he's a lot. I mean, Luke Hughes, that was his thing last year was um, really good offensively, but had a bit of issues defensively, but I mean, he was went sixth. Right. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things you take that risk and develop a defensive game. I mean, that can be developed, right? Offense, not so much all the time. If you have that instinct, it's not, you can't really develop it as much. And, um, you know, his, his upside, I think is really high, his big ceiling. And, um, I talked to him on, uh, Western centric, uh, yesterday, actually, I interviewed him and is saying that he, he compares himself to Charlie McAvoy um in Boston Bruins so you know if he becomes a guy like that that's pretty good so I mean he models his game after him so that's that's pretty good I think I mean he's he's one of the top defenders two-way players in this game and you know had plays with a bit of an edge in a fight as well so that'll be interesting to see if Matecha can replicate that because he's already got the speed if he can round out his game that's definitely going to bode well for him because i think he was drafted pretty late in late teens early 20s and look how well he's doing so if someone's able to draft a charlie mcavoy type player at 10 (laughs) why not right yeah yeah for sure (laughs) moving into the second topic of this episode risers and fallers obviously if players rise you're going to have some that fall um I'm just going to start off with this. Uh, Devin, who is your biggest or who do you think was the biggest climber in Matt's rankings? Well, it seems like I'm talking about this guy a lot lately. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start associating him with me. But uh, that's Danny Zilkin. Uh, he was not even in uh, on uh, Matt's previous rankings, and now he's at number 35. Um, I think he's a name that people besides myself are going to be talking about more and more now in the aftermath of that uh, top prospects game, because he did kind of stand out and um, he, he does have a good, uh, you know, well-rounded um, package to him. And I actually really like where he's at in these, this, this new rankings where he's at 35, because I think he kind of fits as a guy that, you know, really early second, that maybe a team s- snags in the late first, but he's shown that, uh, you know, we, we talked about this last week. He's shown he can play with talent, and that is a talent in of, uh, in of, of itself. Um, and I guess now the, uh, the big thing now is, is it's one thing to play with talent, but it's another thing to be a talent yourself. Yeah. So I want to, you know, I, I guess now to kind of close out this year is, is, is he a talent that um, is complementary, or is he something that can kind of drive things for himself? And I think depending on what the answer is to that question, it will determine where he ultimately goes in this draft. But yeah, to kind of close out the thoughts here, I just want to reiterate that I do really like him at 35. So hats off to you, Matt. (laughs) 
And Matt, seeing as this is your rankings, I probably should have started off with you with that question. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, who is your biggest uh, riser in, in uh, your top 96? Well, yeah, Zilkin's a huge one. Um, I, for some reason, I didn't have him on my first rankings. I'm not sure why, how I missed him, but, uh, you know, that top prospects game kind of put him on the map for me. And then having a guy like Shane Wright come out and say what he yeah, said yeah. about him too, playing yeah. with him. But I do agree with you, Devin, about him being a complimentary piece or can he do something on his own line um, and carry it? Or does he need a guy like Shane Wright to shine? Um, you, we'll see. We'll see when that, yeah. you know, when he gets to the NHL at one point, we'll see if he needs a guy like that. I and mean, it's not a bad thing. It's not yeah. a bad thing to have to need talent on your line to, to shine, but to be a really good player, it's good to be able to carry yourself without someone else having to carry you too. But uh, we'll see how that happens. But I think, yeah, he's a big riser for me. Uh, of course, we've talked about Jagger Furcus uh, yeah. a lot. He jumped into the first yeah. round for me, 26th. Um, I think he's going to have a lot of ceiling. We, we've we talked about him in the past on this show, and uh, we talked about him with Tony as well. And I think he's got a good chance of going in that later first round. Um, talked about Matej Chuck. He was a riser for me. Uh, Cali Odelius was yep. one that came from the second round up to the first. I really like, I looked more at his game for this time and I really like his game. You know, again, we're talking about Swedish defense when we talked about him, talked about him with Alexis and uh, Alexa and, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a guy that's going to be a really good defenseman in the NHL at one point. You know, Peter, you love him a lot. So, yeah, he's he got that mobility. He's got that great pass and great vision. So just any def, anything that an offensive defenseman needs. Um, and he's he's been really impressive as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of movement, I think, on my rankings. You know, you're looking at a lot of guys, but those are the guys that kind of moved the most for me. I mean, there's some like, you know, up and down kind of two spots, three spots, but that's not really massive. But um, those are the big risers, I think, uh, on my side here yeah and uh, to me the biggest one i think is or that's getting a lot more attention right now and fc has him at seventh overall and that's kevin krachinski oh, um, yeah. i yeah. i yeah. i i i have him in that range of being in that 20 to you know 25 type of player right now but he's just a like, continue to impress with it and again kind of the same type of player as cali odelius two-way game and even during the uh, top prospects game, he showed his ability to jump up, break up plays, the mobility, the passing, everything that just stands out. And, you know, he just screams like a top puck mover yeah. um, in this draft class. And, you know, possibly in the future, we'll see where he lands and how he develops because the promise really is there. And of course, you know, me with Pavel Mintyukov, um, okay. you know, he, he's continued to rise up. Um, big riser for you as well. And honestly, I'm, I'm a big fan of all of the, the defense in the top five, yeah. top 20 this year, because there are a lot of really exciting names. You really can't go wrong um, with a Mintyukov, with an Adelia, a Kraczynski, especially in those later rounds where maybe they could be in that top 20 range. We'll see what happens because uh, they're looking pretty solid at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving from the biggest risers to the biggest fallers, um, Matt, who is one player that slid for you from the last rankings to now? Well, biggest one for me, I mean, apart from, I don't want to talk like Mir Shashenko, I mean, we yeah, know why yeah, he's dropping yeah. in a lot of rankings mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully he can, you know, recover from what he's had, you know, his stuff that he's dealing with because um, he's a high end talent. I think he, someone will draft him. Yeah. Um, probably in the first, second round. I mean, it's not like he, he may, you know, end up, um, becoming an NHLer. I mean, he's got the talent, he's got that. Hopefully his health, uh, improves and he, you know, for him, for his lifestyle, not just for hockey yeah. too. So, um, but yeah, he was a follower for me, but that's no fault of his own, of his play and his talent. But, um, for me, it was Maverick Lamaru. Uh, yep. we talked about him with Tony and, uh, kind of looked more at his game after I put him in the first round. And I do agree with what Tony said after looking at more at him at, at looking at him more. Um, you know, he's a big guy, but again, size, someone will draft him probably around that first round range because of that size. But there is a lot of other stuff in this game. that has question marks for me. And uh, I think he's still a second round pick. 
but I dropped him into the 50s, 55, 55th overall when he was a 30, I believe he was 31st or 32nd on my last rankings. So he's dropped into the second round. I think for me, that was my biggest faller. I mean, some other guys kind of dropped. Seamus Casey dropped from my top, uh, from 11 down to 14, not a huge mover really. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, I think that's probably Lamaru was my biggest faller. I mean, there's some other guys that kind of dropped one or two spots, but uh, yeah. Evan, what do you think? So I, the, the player that I zeroed in on isn't the biggest in terms of distance from where they are to, or from where they are to where they were, but it's biggest in terms of what kind of the narrative around their, around them is now, because if you're in the top 10, you know, you're, you're a top tier prospect in this class. And if you're a top 15 now, you're still in the top echelon of, of this class, but top 15 is just not as pretty as top 10. <laughs> um, and the player I'm talking about in this sense is kind of geeky. And I, uh, I actually agree with Matt on this one too, where he's kind of, uh, he's still a top tier talent in this class, but to put him in the top 10, I, I'm not as sold on it as I might've been a few months ago. Um, Matt's got him at 13 now. Um, I think that's right around where he should be, where he's still, you know, a, a top guy, but um, teams don't need to be falling all over themselves at the top part of this draft to be getting them now. Mm. Um, I, I, <laughs> I wanted to, I know I said this when we were talking about the top prospects game and I, and I wanted to see more from him. And I think that's, that's um, part of the reason why I really agree with this because um, for, like I said, then the long, for the longest time, he was one of those like unanimous top guys that, um, you know, if you didn't get uh, right, you didn't get um, Lambert, there was going to be geeky there for you to go get. And now as time goes on, it's like, I mean, yeah, geeky's still a guy you should, you should, you know, take pride in getting if you get him, but he's not somebody that you're as excited about as you might've been a couple months ago. So um, yeah, to see him drop, I, I think that's accurate. I, I agree with it, but it is something to uh, keep in mind as we head down the home stretch into uh, draft season. Yeah. Yeah, with Geeky, it's now becoming an interesting situation because obviously the skating is a still major, you know, a major sticking yeah. point with his yeah. game. Um, you know, he's got the hands, he's got the shot, he's got the awareness in the positioning. It's just, I think at times it's the, you, you're left wanting more with him at certain yeah. times. And, you know, he, he with that kind of size, that kind of potential, you would expect him to play at a little bit more of a consistent pace. And it's just not quite there. And he's, I can understand why he is falling in the rankings. And even the next time around when my rankings come out, he's, he's going to be in that, you know, 13, 15, maybe even 16, 17 range as well. And, and, and again, he's like, he hasn't gotten worse. It's just, you know, yeah. Other yeah. players are getting better and he just hasn't done enough to try and maintain a spot. Um, for me, I, I feel like I can nitpick about seeing, you know, Luca Del Bell, Belouz drop, Owen Beck, um, Bryce O'Connor, Barker, and Hunter Hay. They just drop slightly because of, you know, the OHL, the inconsistencies and in what's happening this season based on no season last year. So it's tough to get a read on them. But um, I'm going to say David Goyette. Um, he was in your, he was a late second round for you last time. And he's a, a 65th, a early third this time around. And again, it's not a major drop, but I, I, I'm just curious to f get Matt's opinions on David Goyette at this point, because he's one of the top rookies, um, 71 points, um, doing some major damage with the Sudbury Wolves. I mean, a really great yeah. passer, great mm -hmm. shooter, uh, two way game is on point. And the size may not be there, but he's got a really great compete level. Um, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to nitpick because it is just a few spots, but to see him in the third round, Matt, uh, <laughs> I, 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 this is probably the only thing that I'm going to, you know, criticize you on this episode. <laughs> Explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, it, he's, he, I think mostly it's because other guys were moving above him. So we kind mm, of pushed yeah. down. Um, and he just ended up being pushed into the third round. I think he does end up being a second round pick, but I feel like a lot of the guys above him were just more, more upside to me. Um, once gotcha. he gets to that upper level, um, you know, like you said, it, it, he didn't move a lot down. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a later second rounder for me at, you know, for the first time around, but I think mostly it's because other guys were moving into those, those areas. So like I moved guys that weren't even in my rankings before. So that kind of just movement happened, but 
I do agree. He does have a lot of, uh, he does have a lot of stuff going for him. He does have, you know, like you said, that, uh, that great uh, playmaking and um, he is leading rookies, you know, in the OHL. And so, I mean, I, I think he does end up being a second round pick, but I think most of the time, mostly it's because other guys are just moving around him and um, just ended up being <laughs> in that third round of it, you know, as it went down, but uh, they us have a lot of talent. And I did, I do think he's a second rounder when all is said and done. And that's the great thing about scouting rankings, all different opinions. And again, we were just joking on here on the show. Um, everybody has their opinions and rankings. And that's what Josh told me when I started getting into my rankings. It's all based on what you see compared to what others see and, you know, talking. That's the main important yeah, thing about yeah. this. That's why I love it. Different viewpoints, getting opinions on other names that I have lower. And this is, and it's the same case in this situation with David Goyette. So, but yeah, great explanation in regards to him. And based on, you know, my rankings as well, as well, uh, obviously the big CHL NHL top prospects game was a big indicator for seeing some of these players in all rankings rise up and down. Um, Matt, did you, did that game have any, you know, sway in your opinion before your rankings came out or was it pretty known uh, after that game that you knew where everyone was going to lie? Well, obvious name is Jagger Perkis. I mean, he, he was a guy that he was on my radar as being a guy that I think would have moved anyway uh, before that game, but he kind of just put an exclamation mark on it um, and how he performed in, in that game amongst, you know, guys that are quote unquote more talented than him. Uh, you know, when, when you're looking at the rankings and stuff, but he could put himself on the map and he's continued to do it even in, you know, league play as well. So he's got, I believe he's got like 78 points or something like that. So uh, for a guy that, uh, you know, he jumped a lot in his statistics from, from last year to this year. I mean, the WH only played a small amount of games, you know, he looked really good um, for before that top prospects game. So I think he just kind of put himself more into the conversation of being a first round pick. He may not have been a first rounder before that game, but I kind of pushed him into that after, you know, seeing his skill level against, similar talent and uh, to stand out um, amongst that talent is pretty good. So Fergus was the biggest one for me on that. Matejchuk kind of put himself more on that. He was captain of the team. I uh, showed really well in that game as two. And then um, a game after that, he had a six assist game or something crazy after that. So <laughs> I think, uh, I think he kind of took, took that game and just moved, moved forward with it. So Fergus and Matejchuk, I think were the biggest, and of course, Zilkin, we talked about him being a guy that I think he really influenced, um, you know, his rankings as well. So those three, for sure, uh, definitely changed what I was thinking before I did my rankings. Devin, I, I know it's been a week and it's hard to remember what we said last week um, without trying to repeat any names. Um same question. Do you think that, you know, the names that Matthew had kind of instilled where you thought players would lie based on their positioning and ranking right now? I mean, yes, yes. And no, um, I, yeah, kind of like, kind of like how you led this off. It's hard not to repeat names yeah. because, uh, yeah, <laughs> there, <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of the answers are the answers. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I do want to say just to kind of pile on, I'm sorry if you're, if you're watching the show for some reason, Connor, but I, I do think the, the, <laughs> the top prospects game uh, kind of steered my thoughts with Connor geeky too. Um, it, it, that was just a prime example of wanting to see more, but yeah. Um, I, I guess the answer to, uh, to your question there, Peter is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say a name that really surprised me and, and that's Noah Warren. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, this is a player, you know, right-handed shot. Um, I, I thought that maybe he would be in kind of like in the third round situation where he's got that upside, that potential where maybe it just teeters on the second round, but Matt was bold and putting him in there. And I'm seeing a lot more rankings, putting him even higher up and that upside that he has in terms of his, you know, physicality, overall defensive awareness in play. I think it's really sticking out and it's catching a lot of prospects attentions right now. Um, or uh, scouts' attention, it's not prospects, but um, to you... I'm catching their attention too. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, to get that kind of you know attention, and, and again, the points aren't there. 21 and 53 would get no, but 
you know, this is only his second season. And we've seen, you know, especially in a league like the QMJHL, where it's all offense, all yeah. going. And yeah. again, plus minus is not really a good indicator, but he is a plus 11. So um, I, I, I have to check to see where his other defensive metrics lie. But it, from what I saw in that game against the, in the top prospects, he was shutting it down effectively. Well, you know, getting into the lanes, blocking shots, yeah. using the body to his advantage, six, five, 214. I mean, that's something that you want and he's a right-handed shot. So he's definitely a player that if you can scoop up right then and there, and you think that it, the potential is there to get more out of him. So be it. I, I I think that was a really great move to see him there. And I think that game had an impact on where his draft stock lies at this yeah. point. No, oh, yeah, that that was another guy that uh, forgot about him. Yeah, he was another guy that kind of got on my radar after that game. So, yeah, he's got some upside for sure. And right hand shot. Montreal, Quebec native, 17 years old. So the fact that he's still young shows that, no. you know, there's a lot of potential for him in this draft. Um uh, if I'm correct, the draft yeah. is happening first week of July and he's going to yeah. be turning 18 after that. Yeah. So a lot of promise for him right there to reset the show. Uh, we're going to take a quick breather and reset the show. Once again, prospects corner is brought to you by morningskate.io, a daily newsletter delivered to your inbox Monday to Friday, jam packed with the best hockey stuff on the planet. NHL news, rumors, history, funnies, quizzes, you will get it all. You'll see a link in the description below. And all you have to do is just put in your email and it will come directly to your inbox. Getting set for the second part of the show. Once again, I'm Peter Barracchini here with Matthew Zator and Devin Little. We're talking Matthews. We just talked Matthews uh, top 96 NHL rankings, but there was quite a bit more hockey in the junior or, you know, uh, I'm going to say collegiate level. Um, the uh, NCAA's Frozen Four happened this past week. Uh, the championship is about to get started on the 9th, I believe, which is going to be on Sunday. And a lot has happened um, in terms of college free agents, uh, or not free agents, but players signing the entry-level contracts, also free agents going over signings happening as well. And a lot of question marks still have to happen right, uh, as well. So... Let's dive into, uh, I would say, a rapid fire segment of uh, the NCAA edition for uh, the prospects corner. And the, ba- the biggest one of the biggest ones was um, Ken Johnson. Um, he was drafted fifth overall by the Columbus Blue Jackets in 2021. Um, signed his extension. Um, I saw that uh, it was reported by our THW's own Mark Shag with the news of his contract. Um, it seems like he's going to be getting some game time. Uh, then again, you don't want to rush prospects. You want to develop them properly. He could use some AHL time, but if he does get in and see some meaningful minutes before the end of the season, how many goals and even better, because we, he's known as a slick playmaker, how many assists do you think he's going to rack up? Uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, I love Ken Johnson's game right from coming right from Vancouver here. I, you know, I was hoping the Canucks would be able to get him, but that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I'm really a fan of his game. Like you said, he's very slick, a uh, very okay. creative guy, uh, playmaking. Uh, he does those moves like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Zegras, right? He, he's yeah. going to try those things in the NHL at one point. I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, I don't know if he's going to get a lot of games. I think Mark's saying that he probably will um, because the Blue Jackets are out of the playoffs. They're going to probably play some of their prospects and, you mm-hmm where the, where he is so i'm gonna say he's gonna probably score he's probably he'll he'll score a goal um i'm gonna say probably maybe i'll say three goals three goals and maybe like five assists just to keep it a little conservative <laughs> and there's not many games left in the in the season so he doesn't have a lot of time to do it but uh yeah i'll, I'll say three goals five assists should be also be noteworthy that he was a point per game player for Canada at the Olympics. Yeah. And he arrived kind of late, I believe, yeah. um, I believe, or he probably did start. I can't remember what the situation was, but one goal, four assists for five points for team Canada. Yeah. Um, Devin um, Mark Shag did tweet out that he is expected to join the team on Monday. So it looks like he is going to be seeing some game time. Um, what are your thoughts and what do you think of his, uh, you know, short projection for the season 
Well, the Blue Jackets play the Red Wings tonight. So uh, I'm a little, <laughs> just a little disappointed. I don't get to see him tonight, but um, <laughs> no, uh, I think he's going to look honestly really good in a short sample size. Um, I'm actually right there with you, Matt, in terms of what his totals are going to look like. I'm kind of at two or three goals and four or five assists. So anywhere from what, six to eight points, basically. Um, I think, uh, I, I'm not expecting him to like, you know, to, to use a popular phrase right now, I'm not expecting him to completely skill it up in his, uh, short sample <laughs> size, but I am expecting him to really flash what he can do. Um, and kind of, uh, I, basically I'm expecting him to kind of catch some people by surprise in the league, some defensemen yeah. and, uh, he'll be able to uh, put home a nice opportunistic goal and then uh, set up some plays here and there, because as we just said, he's, that's kind of uh, his bread and butter is uh, playmaking. So uh, I'm right there with Matt, two or three goals, four or five assists, six to eight points. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think he's going to get his first goal as well. I mean, he, 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 he underrated shot, but the hands and passing abilities that he has is just yeah. absolutely phenomenal. And you guys mentioned, you know, this Trevor Zegras type qualities that he has. And even um, Dylan Crow, who does work for McKean's, we talked earlier this week and how it's very reminiscent, reminiscent that he's Zegras 2.0. And I think he's going to rack up quite a few more assists. Um, just his vision is just off the charts. It's absolutely phenomenal. And um yeah. Uh, and again, you know, let's hope that he can skill it up because you know what, who cares what, um, you know, some announcer or analyst is saying, this is fun. He's fun. He's yeah. exciting. The blue jackets are going to be fun and exciting down the road. No doubt about that. That's some top tier analysis right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they're not going to listen. They're going to go out there and play their best and yeah. the fans want to see those highlight reel plays. Yeah. Michigan may be getting old, but hey, it still gets people out of their seats no matter what. Oh, yeah. 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 Next on the dock is actually this is going to be num uh, player number two from the University of Michigan that we are going to be talking about. Owen Power, the first overall pick from 2021. Um, th this pains me because we all know what's going to happen. Um, Owen Power is set to make his debut in Toronto, Mississauga <laughs> native. On Tuesday against the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I'm <laughs> dreading him to <laughs> score his first goal because, let's face it, that's been a regular thing for Toronto Maple Leafs fans. Um, but side note, the Buffalo Sabres are getting their top first overall pick. Um, there yep. were talks that he wanted to play one more season, develop a little bit more. The skill set was there, but he wanted to round out his game, and we saw that this year. Um, very mature. Uh, very poised, great confidence, great mobility for his size. And he's expected, the big things are expecting of him in Buffalo right now because, you know, he's possibly going to be the future left-handed shot defenseman, top pairing. Um, Devin, how, how big of an impact do you think this is going to be big for the Sabres, even though that they've been, you know, uh, being, they were, uh, uh, blah, blah. they're <laughs> somewhat of a thorn in team sides right now. Happy Saturday, Peter. Happy Saturday. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, I, I So I'm really intrigued by this because, um, I mean, you don't get picked first overall for no reason, right? And like you said, we have seen Power take make some strides in his game this season. I think that going back to college was a really good thing for him. Um, I think that um, – so to kind of go to your point about the Sabres being kind of a thorn in people's sides, I, I think that there's a lot of players on their team right now who are starting to look more like what people thought they were going to be when they were drafted. I'm thinking of Rasmus Dahlin. I'm thinking of yeah, Dylan yeah. Cousins. I'm thinking of, you know, uh, even Alex Tuck. Um, and when you put a good player on a team with good players who are, you know, at their peak performance right now, or at least, you know, getting there, um, I think that just is going to bring out the best in power too. So, I'm not expecting power to look like, you know, a number, a, a top, you know, a number one pick defenseman um, right out of the gate, but I would not be surprised if he makes a difference right out of the gate, um, just as, you know, a lower in the lineup defenseman. Mm -hmm. um, I think he'll make a defense. I think he'll make a difference just because there's more, um, there's bigger size on their blue line with him on there. Um, and there's more skill. And when you add both of those components to a blue line, your blue line's going to look uh, more dynamic. Your blue line's going to have more offense. It's going to have more defense, and it's probably going to make life just a little bit easier for both your forwards and the other defensemen in their lineup. So I don't know if he's going to, you know, explode in his ten games or however many he plays, 
but he should stand out in a good way. Matt, same question. Well, I love Owen Power as well. And, uh, you know, even though I didn't have him first overall, you know, we kind of going back and forth when we were doing our rankings and predictions last year. But, yeah, I do agree with Devin. I think he's going to make a big impact on the Sabres. They need him to. I mean, they yeah. need him to be a, a guy that's going to lead them. I mean, Rasmus Dahlins looked amazing this year. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's been really good. Um, probably the best he's looked in the NHL so far. And then you're going to add power to that a dynamic. I mean, yeah. even if he's not on the same pairing, which probably they'll split him up on two pairings when, yeah. you know, when, yeah, but they will be together at some point as well. Could be on the power play. We don't know, but I mean, yeah, he's going to add a lot of, a lot of extra stuff that teams are going to have to deal with uh, on the back end um, that they didn't have to before. So yeah, I mean, I think he may not make a huge impact um, on the Sabres direction. I mean, this year they're done. They're nowhere near playoffs, anything like that. But I think he's going to have, um, he's going to be noticeable. He's going to be yeah. noticeable in his 10, whatever games he gets. They may not play him over that nine. So they don't burn that one year of his contract. So, but in the games he'll play, he's going to be noticeable. And like Peter said, he probably will be noticeable against the Maple Leafs because he's playing <laughs> against his hometown team. So, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I already gave my thoughts beforehand, so I'm just going to move on to the next question. Um, Matt, we'll start off with you because, you know, he is a Matthew or Matty Beniers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perfect segue to get off that topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, not much talk about him signing with the Kraken at the moment, but if and when he does, obviously they're probably going to look at getting him into the lineup as well. Same what we're seeing with Johnson and Owen Power as well. Um do you think that he, and again, um, we like to use the word impact because he, had, there's a lot of promise with him being their top, their first overall pick, um, not first overall, overall pick, but their first, uh, round pick in franchise history. Um, yeah. what, what do you make of him possibly coming into the lineup and what do you think he can do? Well, again, Beniers is, here's another guy that the, you know, the Kraken need him to be, they mm -hmm. need him to be a, a big impact player for them right away um you know we all know how the kraken played this year they're one of the worst teams in the league they're going to have a really good first round pick this year um to add to that they could win the lottery and get shane Wright. i mean yeah. they could have shane Wright and maddie veneers on their team that's fun. Um, that'd be pretty good so <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good one to punch so you know veneers signing i'm surprised again i'm yeah i'm surprised he hasn't signed yet um, with all these other guys signing, but I'm sure that'll get done and he'll probably play um, the games with the Kraken this year and show what he can do. Cause I think he's also a future captain of that team. Yeah. Um, putting a lot yeah. of, putting a lot of pressure on this guy, but uh, he definitely has all that. And we've talked about him a lot in the past. Um, great, you know, great two-way player, great. And both all areas of the ice leadership. Um, skill. I mean, he's he's a great player. And he's going to make a huge impact on that team very soon. Hopefully, um, definitely in there for their sakes. And the dog agrees about Matty Beniers. Um, <laughs> Devin, you just mentioned the uh, you know the chef's kiss kind of thing about yeah. Matthew M Matty Beniers and the possibility that they could be in for Shane Wright as well. Um, you know given the fact that he is supposed to be their top line center, um, how much does this impact their future going forward? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, Matt's uh, parents dog got in on the action last week. So my dog wanted to get in. The action this week. There we go. Yes. So all dogs are included here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question one more time? I was, um, how big of an impact like does this have for the Kraken's future, knowing that you know there's a lot of not necessarily pressure on Beniers, but there's a lot of promise and potential sure. given his status uh, within the organization. So, uh, first and foremost, I want to say say that if they get him signed and if they bring him onto the roster, I think that there's a very real chance that Beniers is their top center right away. Um, and I don't know if that is me maybe believing in veneers a little too much, or if that just is the fact that Seattle doesn't have a lot of depth, it could be both. Yeah. But um, I think that veneers is the type of player where um, if you are able to add a Shane, Wright, 
Um, he becomes one of, if not the best second line center in the league in a few years. Yeah. Um, you know, almost it, different players completely, but like it's almost like an Evgeny Malkin type of deal where, oh, wow, yeah. that guy's their second line center. You yeah. could say this exact same thing about Veneers. Um, and to that point, if they don't get Shane right, it's not the end of the world at all because Veneers can be that guy uh, for them. I mean, he could be that guy for them starting next season. Um, and I, I completely agree with you, Matt. I do think he is future captain material for this team. Um, should have been their first captain in franchise history, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> but I, I just think that to have a guy like Beniers in the system, hopefully to have him signed here soon, um, it's a franchise cornerstone. Uh, you know, teams, there are a lot of teams that uh, are in good spots, but they don't have a, a center like Matthew Beniers. Yeah. They don't have a prospect like Beniers. I cover a team like that. <laughs> um, and so for the Kraken to have that, that's one of the pieces you have to have in place to build a team. And obviously they're taking the slow and steady approach with building their, uh, their, their organization. So to have a piece like Beniers, that's one of the hardest pieces to get. So they've already done some of the hardest work by uh, securing that guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I, I mean, just where he's at right now, there's a lot of promise, a lot of hope. Um, you know, I kind of like power and Johnson. You, you the, yeah. the expectations are high for them yeah. to come for him to come into the lineup and, you know, showcase what he's got. I mean, he's, he's been consistent at the collegiate level. Um, saw that this year, we were seeing that at the world juniors and now I think that this is probably the right time for him to possibly take the next step. Then again, it's ultimately his decision of what he wants to do. If he yep. feels like he wants to go yep. back another year, so be it. But I think maybe we're going to learn as soon as possible about his faith and his NHL future because it's going to be a bright one. Yeah. Yes. Moving from one Michigan Wolverine to another, um, Captain Nick Blankenberg uh, signed with the Columbus Blue Jackets as well. Um. Devin, uh, what do you make about his game and what do you project him as or where he fits up into the lineup with the Blue Jackets? Well, first and foremost, I was surprised to see that he signed with the Blue Jackets. Um, that just wasn't a team that I uh, had on my like top candidates for him. Um, now to see him go with Kent Johnson. Yeah, that there's, there's some sense to be made there. Um, and Columbus is low key building a, uh, a really solid um, crop of defensemen too. So yes. to add Blankenberg to it, uh, there's, there's definitely some upside there. Um, what do I make of Blankenberg? Well, Blankenberg is small. Let's be, yeah. it's gotta be said, um, <laughs> but he's got a lot of skill. And that's, if you're going to succeed as a small guy in this league, you've got to have skill. Um, yeah. And Blankenberg has it. He was the captain of the uh, Wolverines this season. Uh, he was a walk-on. Um, this guy is all heart and soul. He's got skill. These are the type of players that if they can make it, fans are going to fall in love with because he's like the little engine that could. Yeah. Um, I don't know that he is going to be a top four guy long term. I really don't. I think he kind of tops out as a bottom six guy, but he could top out as a really good bottom six yeah. guy that um, produces offense and can maybe play on like a second power play unit, um, maybe play some crucial minutes depending on uh, who else is on the blue line. Um, I don't want to put too many limitations on this guy because he's kind of made a career out of proving people wrong, <laughs> but um, I, I don't want to, you know, say, Oh man, this guy's going to be the next Brian Rafalski when um, that's a bit of a high bar to set. Yeah. So um, I think, I think he could step in and really make a name for himself in the NHL, but I wouldn't get it too far ahead of myself and, uh, and say, you know, he's, he's going to be a star in 10 games, uh, this season. Yeah, Matt, the blue jackets just added to their defensive core and we already have names <clears throat> in the system, like Samuel Nasco, Stanislav Zvozil, uh, Carson, Carson, uh, Carson Kulomans, Aiden Hreshuk, mm -hmm. and now you mm -hmm. add Nick Blankenberg into the uh, equation, um, is this part of the plan? Is this what they wanted to go for? Did they, did they want to be this deep in terms of defense and, and with their prospects? Well, they definitely have a rich pool of defense yeah. prospects, that's for sure. Um, who knows if all of them are going to hit, uh, being the, those, you know, the guys that they should be. But um, depth is good. You know, you, yeah. you can trade from depth. You can trade from that strength yeah. and strength to increase a weakness in your forward group, which they do have uh, problems center ice position. I mean, Ken Johnson's not guaranteed to be a centerman. He probably will be a winger. 
So yeah. they still have that hole at center ice, which they could address this year. Um, but I mean, they could trade from that blue line depth to get a good uh, top six center. So, I mean, the, having depth is never a bad thing. Um, as for Blankenberg, I think I've, I mentioned him on grind line when we were talking about the NCAA free agents that the Red Wings could have signed. Um, I'm surprised they didn't look at him. I mean, not saying that they didn't, I mean, they could have, they could have tried, but, uh, to have blue jackets sign him, it's, it's an interesting move, but I mean, Ken Johnson was signed before that suit too. So that could have have, that could have, uh, you know, uh, um, Man, I'm having the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> Could have played a role. Have some merit yeah, to it too, yeah. <laughs> uh, for a reason for it. But I love his game. Again, I like those undersized guys that work hard to become a guy that you know make the NHL, play in the NHL. Um, so that's amazing for him. He's got that great work ethic. Um, just go back to that grind line episode about all I said about him. <laughs> But uh, he's got that great, again, leadership. He was the captain of the team on a team that had a lot of other guys that you'd think would be over him and uh, played with own power on that top pairing as well. Yeah. So yeah. pretty good, pretty good player. Um, I think he, yeah, I think he does top out as, uh, you know, four or five, you know, that six, seven defenseman maybe. But you never know. I, you know, did anyone think Jared Spurgeon would be a top Yeah. Yeah. Top pairing defenseman, not good many comparison. probably. So we'll see what happens with him, but I love his game. Very good comparison in regards to yeah. Jared Spurgeon. Um, great, great uh, offensive awareness, great mobility. And even for a smaller player protects the puck extremely well. So he could fit very well into that category of a defenseman that has that long-term success. Again, Hard, hard to decipher that right now, but you know, if he develops proper, properly, anything can happen. And that's what the Blue Jackets are banking on at this point. From one prospect that's signed to one that's in the loop, maybe in limbo at this point, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but Minnesota was eliminated from the Frozen Four. They lost to Minnesota State, and Matthew Nice, who scored the lone goal for Minnesota, um, his collegiate future is up in the air. There were talks that, you know, earlier on that the Maple Leafs would like to bring him on during the stretch. Once his collegiate season was over, that was before the deadline. Now it looks like, you know, he may be wanting to go back for another year and develop. And that's quite all right. Um, Devin, uh, what do you expect of Matthew Nyes for the Maple Leafs? And do you expect him to sign at, at, at this point? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if he signed. I kind of think that uh, that's coming one way or another. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I mean, I know just from talking to you, I know you're very excited to see him uh, wear the blue and white. Um, I uh, So it's interesting to talk about what difference a guy like Matty Beniers can make for the Seattle Kraken versus the difference that a guy like Matthew Nyes can uh, make for the Toronto Maple Leafs because they're completely different teams, right? Yeah. Uh, the Maple Leafs don't need Nyes to make a difference right now. It would, I mean, obviously it would all, all the benefits in the world if he does, but they don't need him to. No. Whereas the Kraken, you know, if they get Beniers signed, they bring him in, he can't be a dud. They, they need yeah. him to make a difference. Um, I think if Nyes comes in, it, it you know, there's a lot of talent on Toronto's roster. And if he plays with any of it, he's probably going to produce um, just based on who he's playing with. Um, and even, you know, if he plays lower in the lineup, he might get some, um, he might reap the advantages of having the other team's top defenses dealing with Austin Matthews and John Tavares mm -hmm. and Mitch Marners. So if he's playing lower in the lineup, he's not going to be dealing with top defensemen and he can maybe yeah. wreak some havoc in that role. Um, it depends. So basically what I'm saying here is it depends. It depends on if he gets signed. It depends on if he is on the roster and where he's playing and who he's playing with, because there are players in Toronto's bottom six that can definitely help him produce. Yeah. Um, it's a matter of if he's playing with them and in, in what role he does it. Um, yeah. And if he does, if, if he does sign, I expect him to make some noise because he is a damn good prospect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you wouldn't be so excited to see him, Peter, if he wasn't. <laughs> that's a, that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> uh, Matt, um, what did you think of his play throughout the collegiate championship and even the frozen four, despite Minnesota uh, getting eliminated? Well, he, like you said, he scored the only goal in that game. Uh, so he made an impact in that game, 
and he was pretty good. I mean, he was really good in his rest of his season up to the frozen four and in the frozen four. So, and he's a great, great, like we said, he's a great prospect, a power forward type of player that could make a difference on the Maple Leafs. He sure made a difference uh, on his team in the NCAA um, brought him to the frozen four had a heck of a season. Um, I think he does end up signing with the Maple Leafs and could make a difference on that fourth line. We have Nick Embers AZ already there. Um, hasn't made a huge impact yet, but again, I mean, this, this is like early in their career and he's probably not playing a ton either. So yeah, I, I think Nice is going to end up being in the NHL at one point and he probably will sign. It seems like that's where it's going. I don't know how much he'll actually play. But I mean, great prospect, great future for uh, for this kid. That's for sure. Yeah, and Devin alluded to the quality of competition that he may face um, in the lineup. Obviously, it's going to be tough to crack that top six, but he has that top six frame, the shot, the size, the skill, and I think that's going to go well for him because he could utilize that in a bottom four role and make you know t- low, lower tier or players that are lower in the lineup against the opponent make them pay because they may overlook him with that. And he has the physicality and decides to lay a lay a big time hit in the corner along the boards, um, like we've seen during the championship or during the playoffs, because you know the Maple Leafs could use some some of that in sandpaper come playoff time. And if he has the speed to keep up, he has that offensive game, but also the 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 grit that comes with a play, playoff like atmosphere. So I think if either in a top six role or bottom six, I think he would thrive perfectly in that situation. But then again. Um, if he, you see a few games, nothing wrong with putting him in the AHL because he's learning at the pro level as well. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because there's some big question marks on what can happen, but until it happens, um, we, we could just speculate at this point, the Maple Leafs did make another signing. Uh, they signed five foot nine Max Ellis from the university of Notre Dame. Um, not 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 a whole lot on him at this point, but um, I just want to get your thoughts, Matt, on uh, Alice and what he brings to the Maple Leafs. Well, there's another guy's undersized, like you said, five foot nine, um, right winger. I mean, he's he's already 22, so I mean, we don't know. We, this is a guy that's uh, you know he had a good season in the NCAA this year: uh, 16 goals, 28 points, 39 games, so plus 12. Uh, so I mean here's another guy that's, you know, he's undersized, but you never know what could happen with, uh, you know, when he gets to the NHL, there's a lot of undersized forwards that have, have made it. And the Maple Leafs obviously saw something in him. I mean, I know there was Twitter, a whole bunch of thought thinking that, Oh, it's Matthew Nyes of a signing. (laughs) And they were also talking about, you know, they failed to mention he was five foot nine. Who cares? I mean, yep. You know, that doesn't change what type of player he is. Oh, they signed a guy from the NCAA. Oh, no, he's on, he's five foot nine. Oh, that's not, you know, he shouldn't even be talked about. You know, there's a lot of undersized guys that just prove everyone wrong and make it. So I would not, uh, I would not count him out, I'll say. So uh, we'll see what happens when he plays. I don't think he'll play in the NHL this year. I think he's an AHL guy. He'll play on the Marlies mm-hmm. um, and show what he can do. And, um, potentially be a call-up option next year but uh you know don't don't knock a guy for being signed you know just because he's five foot nine and you know lessen the hype on him because uh guys have uh proved people wrong and he's probably proven a lot of people wrong throughout his career so uh don't count him out yeah definitely you don't want to count him out and obviously he may not have the highlight potential of certain other uh, collegiate free agents like a Ben Myers that's getting attraction from a lot of NHL teams but you know he does play with a great pace great energy despite you know being undersized and that's what the Maple Leafs like they like those players that have the work ethic the compete level and the ability to get into the corners no matter if you're 5'9 5'11 6 feet whatever he yeah. does a great job. He has that pace. He has that energy. And I think, yeah, most likely AHL is going to be his destination. And even maybe a while before maybe he gets up to the NHL. But if he develops well and has that mindset and learns well, so be it. That's going to be a really good thing. Um, Devin, uh, would you like to add anything on Max Ellis? 
Yeah, just a couple things. Yeah. One, somebody needs to go to Steve Simmons' house and uh, change his calendar because he seems to think it's still 1992. Um, <laughs> the other thing is uh, this league has seen way too many undersized forwards come in and wreak havoc on the league yes. for people for these type of takes to still yeah. be out there. Yeah. Alex Dabrinka is one of the best players in the league right now. Marty yeah. St. Louis is in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like... Cole Caulfield is one of the best uh, young yeah. players in the league too. Like, I, I don't understand how you can look at a guy's size and be like, oh, never mind. Don't even bother. Like <laughs> yeah. it, there's too many examples to, yeah. Anyways, I'm off my soapbox on that one. Um, <laughs> the, the, as for Ellis himself, um, I do like the, uh, the comments you guys made about how he's destined for the Marlies. It seems like, um, and I think that's fine. You know, I think that too many people get caught up in these uh, college free agents um, being signed to be difference makers right off the bat. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be on power. Not everyone's going to be mad at years. You know, these guys were drafted first and second for a reason. Yeah. Um, these undrafted guys, some of them pan out, some of them don't. And even the ones that don't, they can become quality AHL players. And I know, I realize that, um, like I said, people are looking for NHL talent, but there is value in having guys in your system that can just be really good AHL players. Um, you know, your prospects need to have talent to play with yeah. and whether or not Ellis makes or not is, is, you know, that's up to him, but for him to play a role in Toronto's, uh, system going forward, that's valuable. And I don't understand why, um, a free asset, it's not like Toronto gave up anything other than a contract slot can be viewed as bad like yeah. the only way this is bad is if ellis is, com- is a complete no show from the time he laces them <laughs> up yeah definitely and we're going to go into some quick uh I, I i would assume these are some pretty quick observational questions um were you surprised that the wolverines got eliminated before the championship game um, i mean you look at their roster you, you would expect big things to happen matt uh how shocked were you <laughs> Well, a little bit. Uh, I was a little bit shocked, but, uh, you know, like Greg said, in, when we were talking about the NCAA uh, championship and saying, oh, yeah, Michigan's got it in the bag. Well, he said he kind of pulled, pumped, pumped the brakes of it. These are one game things. Mm-hmm. Um, you lose one, you're out. It doesn't matter how talented you are. And it's not like the other team's not talented, too. So Denver, uh, not De- yeah. Yeah, Denver. Denver beat them. Denver's a really good team. I mean, they got a lot of draft prospects. Um, Devin, you said it was like they're tied with the amount that Michigan had, or one less, or something one like less, that. Yeah. One less than Michigan. So I mean, it's not like they were beat by a bad team. Um, I was a little bit surprised when I saw the final score, but in overtime, it was like you know, sudden death. You're, it doesn't matter, and this happens in the playoffs too. So, yeah, surprised, but not totally. Oh my gosh, this is bad, bad for Michigan. So. <laughs> and they're getting a ton of talent next year. So. <laughs> yeah. If you know what's coming up in the pipeline for Michigan this season, I, I, I think it, it's not the end all be all because they're going to be in it next year. And Devin nine out of the top 10 scores for Michigan are drafted by an NHL team. Um, your, your take on the loss and uh, how, how much of a shock was it? Well, I think that, the point about these, these things happening in one game, like over one game, anything can happen in one game. Right. Um, and I think that's very much what we saw here. Um, you know, before we started recording, I said, maybe it's a completely different story if this was a seven game series. Mm -hmm. Um, and is it shocking? Maybe a little bit because, you know, it was really easy to just point at Michigan and be like, they're going to win it all. So they don't win at all. I mean, it's a little bit of a surprise, but when you look at it from the from the sense of anything can happen in one game, they're playing against Denver, which is a good team in their own right. Let's not undersell that. Um, it, and it was a close game. It went into overtime. Like it, literally every, not only was the game, anything could happen, but then it went into overtime, which again <laughs> is like the epitome of anything can happen. Like it, it, it's, it's a surprise that they lost, but it's also like you can't be too upset about it because it was a close game and it very much, it very easily could have gone their way too. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not too surprised because you play that game again, Michigan probably wins because it's like a 50 yeah. 50 coin flip, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the same boat as you guys. Um, and again, you know, Denver has quite 
a plethora of drafted NHL talent on their team as well. So they went toe to toe with them. Uh, really great, really great outcome, really great uh, game between the two. And now it brings me to my next one. Who will win the championship? Denver, Minnesota. Um, who wants to take the floor with this one? I got it. <laughs> Only because I, you know, they, here I am in Michigan. So uh, I, I'm definitely one of those people that uh, when like my team I'm cheering for loses, I want to see them lose to the champion. So uh, yeah, go Denver. Plus there's a lot of Red Wings on Denver and uh, I'd like to see those guys perform well. Yeah. Those Red Wings are Carter Mazur, Mazur uh, Shai Boyum, Anti Tuomisto, and a, a lot of, again, same like Michigan, great NHL talent, Bobby Brink, Carter Savoy, uh, Michael Benning, Shane Barons, uh, Matt, who do you got? Denver. I got Denver, uh, and mostly because of my prospect of the week, which you'll find out in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so straight to the point, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to probably say um, Denver, but you know what? We've seen upsets happen, yep. um, and anything is possible. Uh, I mean, Minnesota State is in here for a reason, so it's going to be an entertaining game. That yeah. That's... that's uh, no other way to put it. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how that game plays out. And final question. Um, I'm going to try and combine this because I yeah. we, we have it as two, but I think we can combine it into one. Yeah. Um, Devin Levi won the Mike Richards Award as the NCAA's top goaltender. And it's easy to see why. Fantastic uh, season. Um, uh, he, what's his ceiling with the Buffalo Sabres? And, you know... Dryden McKay also won the Hobie Baker award, but didn't win the Mike Richter award. Should Devin Levi have won that? So two parters, one ceiling and two, uh, should Levi have won the Hobie Baker award? Uh, Matt. Well, I was, well, I wasn't surprised that Levi won the Mike Richter award. I mean, he was probably, yeah, he was the best goaltender in the NCAA. I mean, his numbers are insane. 950 crazy 952 save percentage. I mean, he, Barely letting any goals. I mean, this, yeah, is, like, this is insane. <laughs> I don't know how Northeastern didn't even make it to the Frozen Four, mm-hmm. honestly. But um, Aiden McDonough on the on from the Canucks too there on that team. So he's returning. Like we say, he's returning to the North to Northeastern this coming season, just like McDonough. They want to win a championship. I think they have a big chance of doing this, um, especially with him in goal. So I wasn't surprised he won the Mike Richter. His ceiling in the NHL. We don't know. He's a surprising guy. He surprised Team Canada when he became the starter on the World Juniors, which no one thought he would, and dominated. So I wouldn't put him past him to become a top-end NHL goaltender. Um, as for the, the Hobie Baker, I was surprised when the Hobie Baker. I mean, you, you know, Levi, he wins a Mike Richter, doesn't win the be- best goaltender, doesn't win the best player overall. And Dryden McKay is also a goaltender. <laughs> and he didn't yeah. win the Mike Richter. So it's kind of a, there's a disconnect there. Not yeah. saying that McKay's a bad goaltender. He's in the frozen four championship as the goaltender for Minnesota state. So yeah, be that as it may, I, you know, congratulations to him for winning it, but I think Levi should have ultimately got it. Yeah. And also a little surprised that he didn't play any games for team Canada at the Olympics. Mm. I thought he should have, yeah. but Side story, uh, <laughs> Devin, uh, your, your take on the whole um, ceiling with the Sabres and him not winning the Hobie Baker Award. Well, in terms of the Hobie Baker Award, imagine if Igor Shesterkin won the Vesna Trophy, but then Jacob Markstrom won the Hart Trophy. That's basically <laughs> what yeah. we have going on here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, good comparison. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, take that for what you can. Um, as for what his ceiling is, um, coming out of his draft year, I kind of had him penciled in as basically like he tops out as a backup. Um, and since then, I think he's kind of raised his stock a bit. I could easily yeah. see him being a starter in this league now. Um, I got to, in their opening round, the round they lost in, it was against uh, Western Michigan, which is, uh, yeah, go Broncos. Um, <laughs> it was, that was a tough game. The, the only, like, Western Michigan was the better team in that game, but Devin Levi was the reason why they hung in there. I'm pretty sure it went to overtime. Yeah. And uh, Devin Levi stood on his head. So, um I, I think it could be a starter. I'm not going to say he could be like a top tier Andre Vasilevsky type of starter, but I could see he see him being like a um, 
maybe like a a um uh a, a Campbell. I can't remember his, his first name right now, but you're your, your goalie. Yeah, Jack. Jack. I wanted to say Jack, but I knew that wasn't it. Jack Campbell. Yeah. I could see him being a Jack Campbell like tier of goalie. Like yeah. um mm-hmm. and I think that's fine, especially if you've got a really good team in front of you. And that's kind of what Buffalo's building. So um for them to get Levi and that Sam Reinhardt uh, trade, I think kind of an underrated part of that deal, yeah. but he could very much prove to be the most important piece to come out of that trade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Definitely. And, you know, there, there's some competition right now with uh, Levi and Uko Pekka Lukanen, yep. um, who is supposed to be the other top goaltender in that franchise as well. So you got a goaltending duel for that starter position coming down to the wire at some point, and both are looking great. Um, it's got a pretty all right name too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, not the best, <laughs> but pretty all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like you said too, uh, both of you, um, how, it doesn't quite make sense how you win the top goaltender award with the numbers that he has. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal. 1.5 goals against average, 952 save percentage, 21 wins. I mean, and you don't win the top player award. I mean, that, that just kind of, you know, sum, sums it up for me, kind of like you, both of you as well. Um, Interesting to see how the battle for the Sabres top goaltender is going to go because I think both have a case, but I think maybe Levi, maybe given the edge, given his surprise and turnaround and everything like that, but not turnaround, but the surprise and consistency that he's played at, I think he's got a really uh, bright future ahead of him at this point. And a little bonus question. If you cannot tell, baseball (laughs) has started. Um, The Blue Jays. Uh, Toronto Blue Jays, actually, I'm going to reiterate that there's only one Canadian baseball franchise, but they're one of the most exciting teams to watch this season. No doubt about that. We saw that in their first game being down seven, nothing and came back to win 10, eight. Um, guys, I mean, (laughs) is, is this their chance to win the world series? I know Devin, we got two Canadians to one American right now, but, um, you know, uh, I, I'm going to start off with you, Devin. Um, what do you make of the Blue Jays' chances this year? Because I, I even saw that the betting line for them to win the AL East was pretty pretty good odds, if you ask yeah. me. Well, I have to throw in the obligatory go Tigers because here I am. You have to. Um, yep. <laughs> but, but, yes, I do think the Jays have quite the lineup. Um, they're They're almost like... This is kind of, this might be a weird comparison, but they honestly remind me a lot of the Maple Leafs, just in the fact that they've got so much mm. just explosive <laughs> young talent. Um, that like they're 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 made to play exciting baseball. So yeah. um whether they you know go all the way or not, um, is you know, for people who study baseball a lot more than I do, but uh they're gonna play some exciting baseball this year. I, I know I'm gonna watch a bit of it. I love that comparison with the Maple Leafs, how you're basing it off <laughs> talent and not by record. Thank you yeah. so much for <laughs> sparing my feelings there. Um, <laughs> Matt, uh, w- 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 what's your take about the Jays and how excited are you? Do you think that this is their chance to win the World Series? Well, I haven't been as, uh, this excited for the Blue Jays for a long time since Bautista and Donalds yeah. and that team. Uh, I watched almost every game that year and I'm not a huge baseball fan. Um, but whenever the Blue Jays are playing this exciting, um, it's I'll watch it. Um, I understand baseball a lot more now. My brother's huge into baseball. He's he explained everything to me way back when of all the stuff that's happening in the game. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the Blue Jays have as good of a chance of as any team to win the World Series and be a contender for the next bunch of years because they got so much young talent. Like they're mentioning Vladimir Guerrero being 23 and guys ridiculous. like and he's yeah. ridiculous already. What is he going to be like 26, 27 mm-hmm. in the athletic prime? So very exciting team. I know this is a hockey show and we're hockey prospects, but um, we love other sports too, right? So, <laughs> and the Blue Jays are definitely an exciting team. I probably would have lost my mind if there was a full on lockout. And thank God that there's baseball yeah. back. I mean, granted, yeah. we're getting summer hockey. Granted, that's great, but at the same time, baseball is a summer sport. That, that that's that's just the that's just the way of things, yeah, kind of thing. And yeah, uh, I, I I'm excited for the season as well. Um, you know, yeah, rough start for Barrios. Not what he wanted. Guess opening night jitters. It happens to everybody, but he's too good of a pitcher to throw those kind of games consistently. I think he's going to bounce back. And, yeah. you know, Jays fans were already throwing in the towel 
I probably I saw whatever. It. Um, but you know, you, calm down. One game, <laughs> 161 more. Yeah. They came back to win. They got a deep roster. Great players. Let's uh, come back to reality a bit. You yeah. mean Toronto sports fans were overreacting? What do you mean? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> As we move away from that segment of the show, we're going to finish things off with our usual prospects of the week. Um, Matt, you gave a little bit of a teaser to who your prospect of the week was going to be. Why don't you take it away? Well, it is Carter Savoy uh, from Denver. Uh, scored the overtime winner. He was the one that brought them to this point. Uh, super talented forward, of course as much as they to hate it, he is an Edmonton Oilers prospect uh, drafted surprisingly not high. And, you know, back then I was saying he was the first round pick got blasted on Twitter. If everyone remembers this, I couldn't find the tweet. I, I want to find it because I want to tweet it again and say, <laughs> look at what I said way back when of how this guy's going to be. And I'll, I'll probably hopefully find it when he does do stuff in the NHL, because I think he's still an NHL uh, talent that's going to be a top six player and Savoy you know what he's done since he's entered the NCAA after his dominating year uh, in the BCHL I mean he just keeps running and everyone thought he's going to slow down the NCAA because it's against better, better competition he's not slowing down so <laughs> he is such a good player uh, dynamic um, maybe be a good guy to play with uh, Connor McDavid in the future. I mean, yeah, he, he's a talented forward and I'm going to shout him out as my prospect of the week, not just because of what he did in the NCAA uh, semifinal there, but what he's going to do in the future and um, such a talent. That's for sure. Definitely. The Oilers could use some depth scoring, especially in their top six as well, aside from McDavid and Dreisaitl. But good thing about that is that both Carter and Matt Savoy are very similar players. Yeah. And you're seeing that right now. So um, it, it, interesting to see where he plays out, but I think he's going to have a bright future. Uh, Devin, who is your prospect of the week? Yeah, I kind of just uh, changed it on the fly here. Um, <laughs> <I saw> <laughs> I was I, I do want to give a quick shout out, even though we've already talked about him to uh, Nick Blankenberg because uh, he did sign his contract, and I am very eager to see uh, what he does um, with the Blue Jackets. It was weird to me that it was a one year contract. By the way, I don't yeah. think we mentioned oh. that. I expected yeah. a two year deal, but uh, we'll see what comes of that. Um, but my actual prospect of the week is going to be a Western Michigan boy, go Broncos. Uh, he recently signed his ELC with the Philadelphia Flyers, and that is defenseman Ronnie Adderd. Um, 23 years old, was drafted 72nd overall in the 2019 draft. He's got good size, six foot three, 207. And this dude can move the puck, let me tell you. Um, he had 36 points in 39 games with Western Michigan. Uh, and that goes after uh, the previous season where he had 22 points and 25. So this is um, a puck moving defenseman with size right-handed. And we all know how much teams go gaga for uh, mm -hmm. players like that. Um, also a Michigan native. So uh, would have liked to have seen him wear the red and white, but Hey, orange and white will look good on him too. Um, I think that this guy, um, he doesn't have top line potential. I'm not, I'm not even going to try to hype him up that much, but I think he could very much become a middle pairing guy that uh, sees some second unit power play time because of his puck moving ability can spring the attack with it and will add some dimension to their, uh, to their blue line because of his size, because of his skill. Um, I'm excited to see what he does at the pro level because he was a real standout for Western Michigan this year. And when you can stand out for a team that made it to the, um, the final eight in the, uh, the tournament, um, you probably got a really good player on your hands. Yeah. Definitely great selection. Uh, congrats on him making his NHL debut. I believe it was at the same time that the Maple Leafs played, um, when Nick Abrazzi made his NHL debut. So yes. double dose of first laps on the ice for him as well. My prospect of the week is we've already talked about him. It's going to Owen power and not necessarily just because of his overall play and everything like that. We, we, we we've talked that constantly on the show previously. And even today, um, 
it's more so about him getting the contract and giving hope to the Buffalo Sabres organization because they've been through a lot over the past few years. And he serves as kind of like the next wave or the new era of the Buffalo Sabres. And we're seeing how well they're, well they're playing down the stretch with great intensity, you know, being a thorn in team size. I got that right at that time. Um, <laughs> and j- just, you know, the Jack Eichel era, went out on a sour note and now you're getting a top tier defensive prospect, probably future captain with Owen power. So the fact that he's providing some light, some promise for the future, I think it's a really great step for him. Great step for the Sabres and a great step for the fans because they really deserve it. And this contract and his play is going to dictate that success and even for the future. And that is all for this episode of the prospects corner. Once again, uh, this is being brought to you by morningskate.io. Submit your email in the link below to subscribe to our daily newsletter filled with hockey news, rumors, history, quizzes, and everything else hockey fun related. You will not regret it. For Matthew Zader and Devin Little, I am Peter Barracchini, and we'll see you next time on Prospects Corner.